It's something that we have to learn to do. It comes basically from my degree that I did at Warwick University many, many moons ago, if I can do the, the long ago action from there was a princess long ago. Um, it was basically a degree in dramatic arts, that is educational drama. Uh, it's a method brought by uh, Dorothy Heathcote in the 60s and it was used all over England and Wales and Scotland and Northern Ireland in schools uh, to teach any kind of subject. So it's basically using your imagination to learn. So it's a learning medium. And I have changed that learning medium into something which can be used in teaching English. And I have been doing it for 40 years in five different countries on a long-term basis. I've lived and worked in five different countries and I've also visited another 12 countries where I have been promoting this methodology. It isn't my methodology. It's just that I have developed it and honed it down and I'm continually learning and I would like to pass it on to you today. So I am challenging ELT methodology and I'm also trying to explain a challenging kind of methodology for students and for teachers to grasp and to, to get on with. Once they do grasp it and once they do get on with it, then they don't want to teach or learn in any other way because it's so motivating. Okay, I've got the uh, slides here. And I'm going to start with the first slide. If you have any questions, please put them in the box. Wait a moment. Oh, I'm doing the wrong thing, sorry. Okay. These are the questions for today. Why is ELT failing to engage students all around the world? We hear about dropout rates. We hear about unmotivated students. I used to hear about unmotivated students only in secondary. I've been a secondary teacher all my life, really. Um, and I've just gone into primary. Although I have done some primary teaching, I've done some kindergarten teaching, and I've done some adult teaching. But my passion really is secondary. And um, I used to hear that students were unmotivated in secondary, but then I began to hear that they were unmotivated in primary. And I began to look at why it was that students were unmotivated at school when I think that school should be a challenging place, should be an exciting place, it should be a place where children learn the joy of learning and they should uh, really feel a passion for what they are being offered and this apparently wasn't really happening. So I began to look at what it was that we were doing in secondary school that we were doing in primary school and how we could pass that on. And this is where the drama came in because drama really is just extending children's childhood play into the older years. And uh, I think we all need to play. I think we all need to be creative. I think we all need to maintain our childhood curiosity, if you like, about the world. I also want to know how we can embrace diversity. I asked you, those of you who were in the classroom early, to put up what country you come from. And I found uh, up to now, we are from, uh, let me see, um, 18 different countries and I think there are some people who haven't said yet what country uh, they come from. So I'm interested in diversity in general, having lived in five countries and learned how other cultures tick, but I'm also interested in diversity in the classroom and how we can develop this intercultural ability amongst our English language speakers all around the world. In my position as coordinator of English in Action, where I'm training 15 teachers to teach English through drama in special education, we have enormous diversity. 
and I'm going to explain that to you uh, when I uh, go a little bit further along. Okay, how do we make education more equitable? I'm very concerned about this huge gap between the rich and the poor, huge gaps in status between middle class and lower working class. I'm very, very concerned about poverty and how that affects learning. And I, I feel that we can do something about it, but we have to think about a sustainable education if we're going to have a sustainable world. So my, um, my, my understanding of what education is, is not just about English language teaching. It's about what real education is and how we can use that in our English language teaching to make a more sustainable education. How can we include all cultures? How can we make sure that we really do address diversity and have an inclusive kind of education in all our schools all over the world? And how do we help teachers to help their students no matter their challenges to learning? So instead of saying, oh, um, these students are terrible, instead of saying these students aren't disciplined, instead of saying these students can't learn anything, how can we as teachers change and say, okay, I've found a way to help these students. So what I'm trying to do all the time is to help teachers to help their students. Put your questions in the box, please, and I'll try and address them. Yeah, okay, I'll try and address them at the end, so if you put them in the box. We work with Peter Brook's idea of the speaking body in the empty space. Here in our special schools, we have very, very few resources. Our main resources are teachers and students. In our teaching of English in special education, we started in 2010, so we're five years old now. In our situation, we don't even have one English book provided by the ministry. So I go begging. I go to the publishers, I go to the bookshops, and I beg for books. And the, luckily, we have been provided with class libraries from certain bookshops, and uh, the publishers have been very, very generous. But I really am concerned that we can use our resources very, very well if we think about it. And if we think about how we can use the speaking body in the empty space. Many of you, I know, have similar resources to ours. None. And so we need to use those resources that we've got to advantage. So, how do we use the speaking body in the empty space? I've always used drama, educational drama, to teach English. But I've recently um, been researching on gender issues. And I've come across this expression, performative activity, which really represents drama for me. But it may be a nicer word for people, because some people are put off by the word drama. They get very frightened when they hear theater or drama. And they think it's about um, you know, to be or not to be, that is the question, and that you have to be uh, an amazing uh, theatrician. I am not an amazing theatrician. I'm a dramatist. And I, I divide those two things very clearly in my own mind. Performativity refers to the doing of language. It opposes more abstract conceptions of language as a structure of meaning or symbol system with an emphasis on the role of language in the concrete, in particular transactions of speakers and hearers at specific sites. Performativity focuses on language as action. Hence the name of our, of our program here in Argentina. It's called English in Action. Well, you can see the sun shining through my, my skylights and reflecting off my glasses. I'll try and turn a little bit. OK. Uh, I've recently been in, in conversation with Scott Thornbury, who you all know. And he has done a lovely 
uh, PowerPoint on the learning body. And I've actually stolen this quotation from him. Sorry, Scott. Uh, he's not here, so he won't know unless somebody tells him. OK. Um, acting out word meanings helps school-age children to increase their L1 vocabularies. Enacting or miming a verb resulted in better retention than explaining it. This comes from Lindstromberg and Boers, 2005. And the reference is there. And I just took it from Scott Thornbury's The Learning Body. I was very excited to see that he's uh, interested in this issue. I think that's a very exciting thing. So, we are called English in Action. It means that we learn the language through acting out and also through doing action, through language games, through miming, through role playing, through improvisation. And we have certain rules that we apply in all our classrooms. These are the achievements that we have made over the, well, really the first three years we got to this point. Our students come from the street. Some of them are street kids. Our students come from orphanages. Our students have a whole array of learning difficulties. We teach in hospitals. We teach in a psychiatric unit in a hospital with adolescents. And we have made these achievements through our English in Action program. So I'm going to be showing you some photographs now. We're going to stop the recording in a moment um, because I cannot have the photographs recorded to go up on the site because I cannot have them published. But if you will notice in the photographs these achievements, each photograph has a title at the top. And I would like you to notice particularly um, what the students are actually doing and how we are making these achievements, how we are reaching these goals of ours. Um, there's one, st one photograph in particular where um, Okay, I'll go on because I think we've stopped the recording. Okay. I hope I'll be able to explain everything to you clearly. Okay, our motto at the beginning was from I can't to I can. Most of these students are in special schools because they have failed. And they have uh, failed for all sorts of reasons. And they come to us with the idea that they can't learn English. English has never been taught in special schools in Argentina because nobody could think of a way of doing it. And this is why I use the word challenging, because we've also challenged that idea. We've challenged the idea that students in special schools cannot learn a foreign language. And we are actually doing it. And uh, we think that's very important. The uh, special education department heard about a project I was actually offering to um, Lenguas Extranjeras, which is the foreign languages department of the Ministry of Education. And the special education department had been thinking for years about how they could comply with the law of inclusion and include all mainstream subjects in the special education department, one of which was teaching English from grade one, which happens in all the state schools in Argentina. So uh, when they heard about my project, they thought, oh, this could be a really good way of doing it. And so I was taken out of the foreign languages department, and I was entrenched in the special education department. So we had this motto from I can't to I can, so that we tried our best to convince the students that they really could learn English. We also had to convince the directors of the schools, because this program was sort of thrust upon them, if you like, and uh, we just started going into the schools and started teaching English. 
and uh, many of the directors felt that it was an impossible, it was mission impossible, and uh, there was a lot of skepticism at the beginning. We have overcome that now because we've been able to move from from I can't to I can to our, our second motto, which is making visible the invisible and giving voice to the voiceless. Here I've got a little photograph which I can show you and can be in the recording because the students are wearing masks. The little boy on the right was uh, a student who would never ever join in the classes at the beginning. He actually hid behind the cupboard at the back. He hid in the corner and he wouldn't join in the classes at all. My teacher was very, very careful about how she dealt with him and she just encouraged him to join in. She never forced him, she never told him off, she never did anything to make him feel visible. She left him in hiding and eventually he started crawling out and he started joining in the class. He came nearer, he came closer, he started joining in the activities and this is one of our great achievements to have a student who wouldn't join in anything and then started joining in. Um, so I'm going to explain more about how we make visible the invisible and how we give voice to the voiceless. These are the kind of schools we teach in and we also do home visits. We include all the students in all the classes and we have this notion that the teacher should not be the center of the classroom, nor should the syllabus, nor should the curriculum. The student has to be the center of the learning process. He has to be at the beginning of the learning process. And we do this by partly by removing the desks. So our first rule and our only rule really is get rid of the desks. We don't use textbooks, we don't use pen and paper, we only have two periods a week in each of the schools. So we have very, very, um, very, very um, limited resources and so we have even less resources in a sense because we sit in the magic circle. The magic circle is the basis for all our work and through the magic circle the teacher herself or himself, we're all females actually in this program, but the teacher joins the students in the magic circle and so we uh, have this, there's a conversation going on in the side and I can't keep up with it so I'm going to ignore it for the moment. Um, so we have this notion that Everybody in the class is included. There is nobody outside the circle. We have no gaps in the seats in the circle so that the magic cannot escape. Uh, the ability to move furniture is so important to facilitate learning, as Chris says, and it's the basis of our work. We have to sit in a circle, either on chairs or on the floor, doesn't matter, but uh, no teacher up front the teacher is not the transmitter of so-called knowledge. The teacher is a facilitator of learning the language. Okay, these are some of the educational needs that we deal with and you can see that there is enormous diversity. I'm not going to read them out to you because I know you can all read. Um, some of you, uh, you have a 13-year-old who has ADHD, so it's very close to home for you. I think everybody in every classroom all over the world has students who are challenging. And so this is why I wanted to talk to as many people as I could in order to be able to pass on this kind of methodology. I know that uh, in some cases, um, in some cases, people think that uh, it's very difficult to work on inclusion because if you have one or two or three students in your, your room who have diagnosed learning difficulties, you've still got the majority to cater for 
and this is where mixed ability was always very uh, appealing to me in the old days, you know, in, in the late 60s, in the early 70s when I started teaching. Uh, I always believed that mixed ability was enriching because I, I never felt that um, you could level students. People here talk about leveling the students. I think as soon as you've got two students, you've got diversity. It doesn't matter what age they are. It doesn't matter what their abilities are. And so these are the kind of students that we're dealing with. I'm running a PLC, which is a professional learning community. I have 15 teachers who are teaching in 28 different places in this vast city of Buenos Aires. And they all live in different places as well. They don't live near me necessarily. They don't live near the ministry necessarily. So we meet once a month face to face and I do workshops. We don't do too much technical details. Um, we actually learn together. They share their ideas. They share what works and what doesn't work. They um, tell about their problems and they find solutions for each other. We can't always find solutions, but we generally do. And that's because we're very positive and we're great believers in our system. I always think that teachers' beliefs are very, very important. We have a virtual platform on the Ning. We were going to move to Edmodo, but we didn't. We stayed on the Ning. We have a virtual classroom once a month in WizIQ. And uh, I encourage them to present at conferences. I encourage them to uh, do a living PowerPoint with me. I have devised a, a way of explaining our, our work through showing our work. So we do a living PowerPoint where we actually act out this information that I'm showing you on the PowerPoint. And uh, we feel we're putting our money where our mouth is and we're working on the talking statues of Rome as a concept and uh, including Tessa Woodward's loop input theory. So we are showing the methodology by doing the methodology. And I encourage my, my teachers to research, to publish articles, and some of them have had articles published in quite important journals. So we're very excited about that. Dorothy Hethcott said, drama is the art of self-control. And many of our students need self-control. They are going through a, a school system which does not teach them self-control. They are kept in, uh, in their seats. The rows are even, uh, the desks are even in rows. And students cannot learn self-control like that, I believe. I, I think that we have to train them in the art of self-control by taking away the desk by taking away the restrictions. And uh, in that way, we help them to develop. Drama is the art of self-control. And as it's a holistic discipline, it deals with the five developmental processes of what we call the spice of English language teaching. This is a little acronym which I train my teachers in so that every lesson must cover these five developmental processes. So we deal with social development. We deal with physical development. We deal with intellectual development, creative development, and emotional development. How do we do these things? Well, we do them all through drama. So in having the magic circle, we deal with the social nature of the classroom. The classroom is a place where there should be cooperation, collaboration, where students should feel and they should feel for themselves and for others. So there should be turn taking, there should be understanding, there should be empathy. 
And I don't really care how many students are in the room. I've taught to groups of 45 students when I was in Singapore. And it really, really doesn't matter what size the class is. A lot of teachers say, oh, it's impossible to teach this way with big classes. I honestly don't agree because I have done it with big classes. And I think it's a matter of training the students to work in a completely different way. Our classrooms are set up so as to be unsociable. And I think that this is something that's really, really important, not only for students with special needs, but for all students. We work on the physical. Um, in our circle, every, every time we teach, we have the hello song. We have the we're beginning the English class song. Most of my teachers make up their own songs, or they use songs that we found on the internet, on YouTube. Uh, we use nursery rhymes, which we change. Uh, we use um, all kinds of songs because we believe that uh, songs are a uniting force. Songs bring people together. They create community. So. We do, um, we do a song at the beginning to open the class. We then, um, working in the magic circle all the time, we have the students greet each other. And we have the students use a ball. Um, if you can imagine, um, not, a, not a very big basketball size ball or even a football size ball, but one in the middle. Not a tennis ball because that's too small. But we pass the ball around and the ball just acts as a focus. It also develops our second uh, criterion, which is the physical development of the students. But I'll go on to that in a moment. So we do the name game, for example. We, do, uh, we work on a goodbye song at the end where the students each pass on by hand uh, a slap and it goes all around the circle and then we count to ten and the last person who receives the slap has to invent, make up uh, a way of saying goodbye today, which is a different way. So they have to say goodbye or in a silly voice and use their hands in a different way instead of just saying bye. So we are always working in the mind's eye. We're always working on creativity. We, we try all the time to do real learning in imagined worlds, which is one of Patrice Baldwin's sayings. Okay, physical development. We work on the body and on the voice. We do breathing exercises just as actors do when they're warming up to do the play. So a lot of these techniques come from the theatre, but they're actually in uh, drama for education. Um, we work on the voice. I've, al I've already done a webinar called Sounds Fun, which you can find on my blog spot, where we work with the students on making sounds. I think that we need to do that before we do pronunciation because many of the sounds in English are so very different from the sounds in the mother tongue. And we work on using the voice, using their names for identity, and using the voice with their names. So we ask them to breathe in, we ask them to hold their hands on their diaphragms, they breathe in to the count of four, breathe out to the count of four, breathe in to the count of eight, breathe out to the count of eight, then we take it to 16, and then we ask them to breathe in for as long as they possibly can, to hold the air, and then to choose a vowel sound where they breathe out with the vowel sound. So they or each choose a different vowel and they say, for example, uh, and they keep it going for as long as they can. And in some cases, this really surprises them. And they find it very, um, very motivating, very engaging. They've never done anything like this in their mother tongue. And why on earth are they doing it in, in English? So um, we work on the voice. We have lots and lots of different breathing exercises. And then we work on keep fit exercises, if you like, body movement. So we do, for example, 
the uh, limb count. So each of them uh, works in the circle, standing up. They breathe in, and then they do one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Half. And then we do one, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. Half. One, two, one, two, half. One, one. But we do it with all the limbs. So it, it ends up being a lovely movement exercise. You're also using English, you're counting. Uh, you can do it with spelling. You can do it with whatever you like. And then we work on the cognitive aspect. So we always work on thinking skills. Basically, um, I'm going to sh show you this later, but we work with stories. We derive all our language from stories. And we do lots of warm-up exercises. We do lots of games, language games, from the stories. And we derive the meaning from the stories. So we work on cognitive growth and thinking skills all, all the time based on songs, stories, films, poems, um, movies, whatever you want. We have to have a trigger for the language. So we don't use textbooks. We don't have textbooks. And we don't teach grammar. Uh, we work on the creative skills all the time. We use the mind's eye. We work on the imagination. And we have students thinking first before they speak. So for example, uh, yesterday I was observing one of my girls in a school in San Telmo in Buenos Aires. And she was passing a scarf around to the students and the students had to say this is not a scarf this is and then they had to do an action with it so uh, one of them for example would wrap the scarf around their around their face and bring out a gun and just mime being a robber mime being a thief and so then it was passed on to the next person so the next person says, this is not a, or I am not a thief, I am, and then they would use the scarf as a, a walking stick. I'm an old person. So these, um, these exercises really use the body and the voice and the mind and the soul and the heart and uh, whatever other kind of abilities we have in this learning body of ours. And then we work on the emotions. Many of our students find it very, very difficult to control themselves. They have, as you have seen in the list, they have had traumas. Uh, they have suffered a lot. They come from dysfunctional families. In some cases, their fathers are in prison. In some cases, maybe their mothers are prostitutes. 